Well, I'd like for you to turn in your copy of God's Word this morning to Psalm chapter 37, and we're going to look at one verse this morning, but we're going to take the sermon this morning has three points, but we're going to take the first two to get to Psalm 37 for us. I want you to go on and turn there. Psalm 37 4. I, I tell you, one of the things about a leader, whether it's the pastor of a church or whether it's a leader of any organization, one of the things about uh, those that are in leadership is they realize that uh, you don't know everything. You don't know even what you don't know. <laughs> and so a smart leader is somebody that surrounds themselves, particularly with those that are good at what they're not so good at. And here I'm blessed with staff, the staff that I have, uh, Joey and Jamie. I'm blessed with the deacons that I've got and uh, many others. I tell you, one of the things, just to let you all know, um, you know, whenever pastors stand up confidently, the Lord gave me a message for you this morning. You know, I know that on this side of that, sometimes it's not quite so clear. I do know that this past week, as I was uh, looking at the sermon that I believed that I need to bring, needed to bring, I just couldn't get any peace about it. Even on, I think it was Thursday morning. Oh, where's Joey? Uh, he's, well, I think he's counting. But uh, even on Thursday morning, I was just sensing, man, this, this isn't flying. I don't know what's going on, but I don't even have peace about Sunday night sermon. And uh, so I stepped into Joey's office and just said, okay, if you were not the music guy, if you were just a member showing up to church after the week we're having, what, what would you uh, think would be most beneficial? And then as I listen to him, again, this, this is what leaders do. We don't have all the answers, and we're dumb if we think we do, and we harm the church or the organization if we act only on our own wisdom. And so I listened to him, and it was, with, it was as if the Holy Spirit in my heart was saying, yes, yes, that, that's right, that's right. Uh, we need a word of encouragement. We need a word as we come this morning uh, to remind ourselves, to reorient ourselves, to look at what uh, the Lord has given to us. And so I've titled this sermon this morning, Find Our, Finding Our Happiness Again. And I'm rooting it in Psalm chapter 37, verse 4. Actually, it's where I'm drawing it from. And this has been an interesting, not just week, but year. Not just week, but year. I'm telling you, if you're someone that has the TV on the news 24-7, if you are someone that does that, why would you do that? Why would you torture yourself? One of the principles that I am more so striving to live by is if I cannot do anything about it, I will choose not to worry about it. I'll pray about it, but if I cannot do anything about it, I'm not going to fill that with my mind. I'm not going to worry about it. And as we look at all that's going on uh, you know, with the, the virus and looking at the numbers, and we realize that there is a virus, but we're looking at the numbers and thinking, why is this all a mess? With looking at the numbers that we're seeing, 99% have mild uh, symptoms, and then we're looking at the election and even realize that while many are proclaiming a, a, a new president of the United States, our uh, President Trump is still making his way through the court system, and it's just, why would you watch the news? <laughs> uh, but I'm telling you, I realize that many of us have, and many of us don't want to put our head in the sand, and I'm not asking us to do that, not instructing us to do that, but I'm just, I want us to reorient ourselves and talk about how it is that if we have lost our happiness, how we can get that back. So this morning, the text is Psalm chapter 37, verse 4, and it simply says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Okay? So what we're going to do is we are going to come back to that verse, but I want to set that verse up by looking at a couple of points before we get to that. I want us, and some of this is going to be familiar, good. One of the words that we see Paul instructing Timothy a couple of times as he wrote to him is remind them of these things. A lot of times whenever I'm preaching, you're going to say, hey, I remember this. Well, good, that's kind of instilling God's truth even deeper into your mind and into your heart. But I want us to look at some truths, and I want us to get back to Psalm 37, 4, and realize, one, that it's a command, and two, there's a blessing that's attached to it. The command, take delight in the Lord, to the, 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 the blessing from it is he'll give you your heart's desires. So let's go on and, and dig into this. If you've got your bulletin with the sermon notes uh, page, you can go on and start filling in not only the blanks, but fill in some thoughts and um, things along the way. Let's go on and dig in. Number one, God created us to be happy. 
He created us to be happy. He did this. The, the, the desire for happiness is not something that happened as a result of Genesis chapter 3. You know, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, and then from that point on, we've craved happiness ever since. No, that, that's not the way it happened. God created Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden for them to enjoy that would cultivate happiness. Happiness is actually the way that God created us. God created us that way. In fact, let me just show you some scripture, and I'm going to have these scriptures on the screen, because otherwise it would take us a long time to turn to many of these. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Now, I could have done 3 through 8. I could have, you know, taken you further. Let me just give you the first three. These are commonly called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Warren Wiersbe, uh, someone who was a godly man who wrote prolifically uh, about Scripture. He was also a pastor. He called these the Be Happy Attitudes, and rightfully so, because look at the first word in every one of them. Look at verse 3, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. We could keep on going. There are eight of these. Every one of them begins with blessed. Okay, so what's the word blessed mean? Well, if you were to look at the original language, the Greek word, the Greek word makarios, it actually means blessed, but it also means happy. You know, if you are someone who is a blessed person, you're going to be happy, right? If you say, hey, you know, how are you doing? Well, I feel blessed. What that means is you are happy. And so this word that Jesus gave, we could easily say that the, the Beatitudes, we could easily translate it, happy are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Happy are the humble, so on and so forth. Jesus in the Beatitudes is telling us how to achieve happiness. Because he created us to desire happiness. He tells us in his word how to get it. Look at uh, Romans chapter 4. verse. I could pick so many verses, but I just want to develop this point very briefly and then move on to the next. In Romans chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, Paul, as he's led by the Holy Spirit, uses this same word that Jesus used when he said blessed. In Romans chapter seven, 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul says this, Blessed! are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the person who will never charge, who the Lord will never charge with sin. He says blessed. It's the Greek word, same word that Jesus used, makarios, means happy. I mean, after all, how would you feel if you were standing before the Lord and you knew that you had broken his laws? Not only do you know that he knows this, but you know your conscience is convicting you and you know he's a holy God and you know he cannot just overlook sin, he has to punish sin. And you know that he is going to judge sin. But then he says, you know what? You have trusted in me, you are forgiven. You don't have any sins whatsoever. You are coming into heaven with me. There was a time in your life that you gave your life to me. You have spent the rest of your life demonstrating that you truly did trust in me. Your sins are wiped clean. Come on into heaven. What do you think somebody would feel like? Blessed, but also happy. Happy. I'm telling you, this word is used over and over and over and over in the New Testament. If we as Christians say, because a lot of people look at Scripture and they say, well, you know, if I was to really comply with the Bible, if I was to really get serious about it, that robs me of happiness. We somehow think that God wrote us a book to steal us from the happiness that we long for, and that is not true. I'm telling you that as our nation continues to reject a Christian worldview. It never was really a Christian nation. We had Christian principles. I doubt that there's ever been such a thing as a Christian nation. God, God didn't create a nation. He created churches that are to be Christian, and churches are to permeate their culture, but we did have a Christian worldview to some extent, to some extent. But as our nation continues to reject more and more of God's word, how many of you know it's feeling less safe? How many of you know it's feeling less just? How many of you know it, it, we, it is creating all sorts of havoc as we are moving away from a Christian worldview? I'm telling you, the Bible was given us to cultivate and to create happiness within us, within our churches, within our communities, anyone who will give their life to Jesus. And I tell you, even as you look at the Old Testament, 
The book of uh, Psalms begins this way. Listen to the book of Psalms, chapter 1, verse 1. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. How happy is the one who does what God has said to do in his word. He doesn't say how holy. Now that would be true, but he doesn't say holy. He says how happy is the one who has determined to obey the word of God. I'm telling you that God's word has been given to us so that we can understand how we can ultimately have happiness, have happiness. If we don't spend time in God's word, if we don't get God's word into our mind and then swallow it through reflection and meditation and get God's word down into our heart, we do so to our own harm because we crave happiness. We crave happiness talked about this uh, to us before i mean this is just a uh, this isn't some you know philosophical thing we we make every decision we make based on what will make us happy i guarantee you this morning when you got up you didn't look in the cupboard for breakfast and say now what would make me feel miserable what what would really taste really nasty in my mouth you didn't do that I guarantee you, when you looked in the closet and thought, okay, what clothes am I going to wear? You didn't say, hey, let's find my least favorite outfit, and that's what I'm going to wear today. You didn't do that. Over and over, I mean, when, when you were looking for a job, what job would I feel miserable in? You didn't do that. What job would I enjoy? That's, that's the question we asked ourselves. When you were looking for a spouse, you didn't say, now, who am I going to feel miserable with for the rest of my life? No, you're saying, who would I enjoy being with for the rest of my life everything is rooted in a desire for happiness every decision we make is rooted in what would i enjoy and that's not bad god made us that way god made us that way the problem arises when we short circuit it and we look for happiness in ways that god has told us don't do that <laughs> right uh, we look for happiness oftentimes we look for it in affirmation from others and i'm telling you this happens a lot today you know uh this uh whenever we do something or whatever else we achieved a reward or award or whatever and did i get acknowledged for for what i did if 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 i don't get the affirmation from others then i'm not happy i'm telling you social media has really really distorted this whole thing i'm gonna put a picture uh, uh, up and i'm gonna look at you know how many people like my picture and i get extra bonus points if more people like my picture than that person had like their picture it's all in rooted in this superficial desire to have happiness and it's short-circuited with okay i'm not going to have happiness in the way that god has told me to i'm going to look for it elsewhere and i'm going to look for it in the affirmation of others some find happiness and spending money now is it wrong to be affirmed by others no as long as that's not our primary thing that we're aiming at it's not it we don't do it for others we do it for the lord is it wrong to spend money no but i'm telling you that we oftentimes buy things with money we don't have uh, to impress people that we don't like and we get things that we don't need <laughs> buying items we don't mean need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like and, you know, we try to purchase things to keep up with the Joneses, and just at the time we think we caught up with the Joneses, they refinance. It's spending money, spending money oftentimes, you know, with uh, looking. Then there's the drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol. How many of you know that one of the states in our country just delegalized heroin, cocaine, some of the other things up in Oregon? They just delegalized that. Now, of course, they're saying that it's going to be for a, a certain setting where they're going to, but I'm telling you, it will never stay there. It will never stay there. Looking for things, and we would say, oh, I would never do that. Well, what about eating? That's a socially approved sin of Baptist. <laughs> Uh, looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Well, I tell you, let's go to point number two. God created us to be happy, fill in, in him. God created us to be happy in him. Now, many of the other things can be, they can be a source of happiness. I, I get happy when I spend time with my family. I'm happy whenever I go out for a run and just enjoy nature. I, I get happy whenever I sometimes make a purchase and something that I was looking forward to. There's nothing wrong with that as long as that is secondary. 
as long as that's secondary. Let's talk about the primary. God created us ultimately to be happy in him. Ultimately to be happy in him. One of the things that I worked to memorize, and I got you know, maybe a quarter of the way through it before I just kind of reached saturation point, but it's something called the Westminster Catechism. And this is something that Charles Spurgeon, many of you have heard of Charles Spurgeon, he was the mega church Baptist pastor in London in the 1800s. He actually took the Westminster Catechism. He adapted it because it was Presbyterian. It talked about baby baptism, and so he adapted it to be more Baptistic, and he even used that there in his church to, to teach and to train those who were saved. Westminster Catechism. Question number one was this. What is the chief end of man starts off this way question number one is what is the chief end of man now this is old language old english language but essentially that question gets at this what is mankind's primary aim what are we here for what are we ultimately to be about the business of doing if we were to narrow it down to one at the most two things what are those things what is the chief end of man and the answer that you would memorize the chief end of man is to glorify god and what enjoy him forever the chief end of man is to glorify god and enjoy him forever they understood that this whole thing of following jesus is not just a bunch of rules it's a way to satisfy our desire for happiness What's our ultimate aim in life? There are many secondary aims and many other things that we shouldn't do at all, but there are some things that, yes, we should do, and they're okay to do. They can be a source of happiness, but if you were to boil it down to one at the most two, what is the primary aim? What are we to do here in this life? To glorify God, that means to demonstrate God's goodness and his greatness, to experience that and share it with others, to show others how wonderful our God is, to glorify God and enjoy him ah, all of a sudden we're talking about happiness right if i'm enjoying my god that means he's bringing me happiness the scholars understood that whenever they wrote this passage whenever they wrote this first question and answer to the westminster catechism they understood that we are here to enjoy god not just in heaven but even in this life he is to be the source of our happiness our happiness and yet, I'm telling you, many Christians don't get this. That's why I keep hammering away. Every church that I've been at, that's why I hammer away at it, because many Christians don't get it, because they have been told over and over, or maybe it hasn't been that they've been told, it's just been something that they have just come to think that when I follow the Lord, it is a bunch of rules to obey. Now, I say I believe by grace through faith that I'm saved, that it's grace, but I live as if it's by works. That if I show up to church, I feel good. If I don't show up to church, I feel guilty and hope the preacher doesn't run into me this week. That whenever, you know, I go throughout the week, I'm I know I'm supposed to read my Bible, and if I want to get on good terms with God, I'm going to read my Bible, and then I feel good about myself. But if I don't read my Bible, it's not that I didn't spend time with the Lord. It's that, oh, man, I should have done that, because it's a to-do list. It's a to-do list. I'm telling you, I don't have a to-do list. Well, Kim has a to-do list with me sometimes, but I don't have a to-do list with her. I don't have to think, okay, I have to tell her I love her today, and today I have to do something selflessly for her to bless her, and today I, I don't have a checklist. I love her, and so that stuff just happens naturally. It just happens naturally. That is what it means to be saved. God says, I made you for happiness. I made you with a craving for happiness be happy in me. Be happy in me. Let's go to the book of Psalms. And, and, just, and, and what I did is I went through uh, Psalms just up to our verse, and then we're going to look at our verse. We're going to look at Psalm 37.4, look at one New Testament passage, then point three, we're going to look at our text this morning as the third and the final point. But in Psalms, this book is saturated with this kind of language, to be happy in God to be happy in them. You want to be happy? Be happy in the Lord. It is saturated with that language. Let's just look, and I didn't, I, I had to, I stopped at 37.4. Actually, I went a little farther beyond that, but for our purposes this morning, I cut it off there. There were many passages after that that I, just, that I found that I just said, we don't have time to look at all of that this morning, but let's just look at six. Let's look at six. Psalm 16.11 
Psalm 1611, you reveal the path of life to me. Here it is. In your presence is abundant, what? Joy at your right hand or eternal pleasures. Does this sound like somebody who saw his relationship with God as a duty to be performed? No. He's saying, I want to be around the Lord because as I am with him, I'm getting my desire for happiness satisfied. Do you see this? A lot of Christians don't real either don't realize it or they've long since forgotten the joy of the lord and they've gotten used to something that is so inferior to what god desires for us we have been made to enjoy the lord not just in eternity but here i'm telling you how long does heaven last how long does heaven last for a few years no it lasts for what forever i'm telling you i am telling you that if heaven if all it was was the streets of gold and the gates of pearl and all of the other things that the the last especially the last two chapters of revelation tell us about heaven if that's all it is i'm telling you we will grow bored of those streets of gold very quickly I mean, you know it as well as I do. You make that big, expensive purchase, whether it's a boat or a computer or something like that, and boy, it's so special for a little bit, and then you grow tired of it, and then all of a sudden, you're not just talking you know, about how tired you are of it. You're talking about, man, I gotta get rid of this and get something else, you know? If, if heaven was just the stuff, if that's it, it would be a nightmare to be there forever. It would. It would be a nightmare. I don't care how beautiful the place is. If we had to be there forever and that's all it was, it would be a nightmare. But let me tell you, it is not a nightmare. Do you know why? Because it is not a place that ultimately is about the streets of gold and the gates of pearl and everything else. It is ultimately about what? Enjoying God. God says, hear this in your, in your life. You, me, we're struggling with sin. We want to enjoy the Lord, but sin keeps us from that. But we know that our heart longs for that. In heaven, God says, finally, once and for all, I take away any tendency that you have for sin. Now you can enjoy me unfettered, completely. Oh, now all of a sudden, if our joy is found in the Lord, then we love the golden streets and we love the gates of pearl and everything else, but our joy is Him, and we're never bored with that, never bored with that. God is so infinitely beyond our comprehension that He will always carry a, 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 a mystique about Him. But it's not just about that, it's about a joy and a love and a happiness that we get in our relationship with Him. Psalm 1611, in your presence is abundant joy. You want to be happy? Spend time in the Lord's presence. Psalm 21.6, I won't spend that much time on all these verses. We'll keep you to a Sunday night. <laughs> That's it tonight. Let's, let's get through these verses. Psalm 21.6, you give him blessings forevermore. You cheer him with joy in your presence. You cheer him with joy in your presence. Do you see this? It's not what God gives to the psalmist. It's God himself that is a source of joy. Look at the next one, Psalm 32, 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Be happy in God. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Psalm 34, verses 4 and 5. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. How many of you believe that that's relevant to where we are here this year? He rescued me from all my fears. But look at the next verse, verse 5. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. Do you see that this is not a bunch of rules to be obeyed? This is a relationship with God to be enjoyed. Psalm 37, 4, our verse for today. Take delight in the Lord. Love him, enjoy him. Let him bring you happiness in your heart. Take delight in the Lord. It's actually written as a command. And he will give you your heart's desires. Now, I want us to look at one New Testament passage uh, before we go to point three. And I want you to see that this is not just an Old Testament passage. It's also something that the New Testament saints experienced. The New Testament Jesus followers were not, they did not see being a Christian as just following a bunch of rules. They saw that it was a relationship to be enjoyed. Just listen to the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter three, verse seven. 
Paul says this, but everything that was gained to me, what was he talking about? He was just talking about his pedigree. He was talking about all of the, the parchment that he had on his wall, all of the things that, uh, that he once believed made him feel good about himself. He was Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He was, you know, uh, all, all of these things, circumcised on all of these things that would make a Jew feel special. He said, all of this is what I once found happiness in but it was fleeting it's just like it wouldn't satisfy verse 7 but everything that was gained to me i've considered to be a loss because of christ it was a waste of time because it kept me from enjoying jesus it was a waste of time because it kept me from enjoying jesus now he's enjoying jesus listen as he continues more than that i also consider everything to be a loss Everything is a waste of time. Everything that keeps me from Jesus, I consider it to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And the word that he's using for knowing is one that speaks of experiential knowledge. It is a relationship. Paul is saying anything that keeps me from Jesus, I count it a loss. I don't want to do those things, whatever they are, because they're a distraction in my relationship with Jesus. What caused Paul to do everything that he did why would he go into a city and not ask about the hotel accommodations but ask for what the jail was like because he knew he was going to be there he knew that he was going to be there why would he get beaten and whipped and stoned and everything else why would he put up with that because he loved jesus and he wanted other people to love jesus like he did because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law. I don't want my own righteousness to, to make me what's right with God. I want Jesus' righteousness, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Verse 10, my goal is to know him. This is not a man that's just sitting in a room and, you know, somebody that was just intent on, you know, writing things down and following to the letter of the law. And in following the letter of the law, he in himself would feel closer to the Lord. No, no. When we look at the Apostle Paul, we hear somebody whose heart had discovered what the psalmist had discovered so many years earlier, that God is to be enjoyed that he is to be the source of our happiness. Point number three. When we are happy in him, our desires are met. When we're happy in him, our desires are met. Psalm 37, 4 says this, take delight in the Lord. Be happy in God. And then what does it say? And he'll give you your heart's desires. I'll tell you, back whenever I graduated from high school, I remember this lady, her name was Ruth Sanders, and she was a member there at the church that I went to and uh, that my dad pastored. And uh, I remember graduating from high school, and so you know, we got, I got a few gifts from uh, church members, and I remember Ruth Sanders gave me a little money clip, and on it, it had this verse, Psalm 37, 4. So I looked that verse up, delight yourself in the lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart well what did i desire for this money clip to have you know a purpose <laughs> i wanted money in that money clip so okay lord <laughs> i'm gonna delight myself in you whatever that means so that i can have the desire of my heart money in this money clip i'm telling you this is what i was thinking how, and then it would even go through my mind now how much do i have to delight myself in the lord in order to get the desires of my heart met and then God graciously over time matured me and caused me to realize how self-centered that was. Instead of seeing God as an end in himself, someone to be enjoyed, I was looking at God as a means to an end. God, I will love you if you give me stuff. That's the way I understood that verse. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the delights of your heart, the desires of your heart. And as I began to think about this, and as I began to reflect upon this, I began to realize that when I delighted myself in the Lord, do you know what the desire of my heart was? To know Him, to enjoy Him, 
That was my desire. That was my, when I was finding my happiness in the Lord, my desire was to enjoy Him. I believe that is ultimately what Psalm 37 4 is saying. When you choose to delight yourself in the Lord, He will satisfy your desire to delight in Him. That's it. Write down Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. God is basically saying, how much do you want to enjoy me? You'll experience just as much as me, of, of me as you want to enjoy me. And that's where we come to our point of conclusion. And I want to ask you some serious questions. Serious questions, because in Matthew chapter uh, 7, verses 16 and 20, Jesus says, not just once, but twice, by their fruit, you'll know them. By their fruit, you'll know them. Now, I believe that there are various fruit, various evidences, various things that our life produces that can demonstrate whether or not we truly belong to the Lord. But what I have shared with you this morning, I believe, is the primary fruit the primary fruit. Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23 says this, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? Jesus said on the day of judgment, there's going to be many people that stand before him and say, Lord, we had a to-do list. That's what we understood Christianity to be. It was a to-do list. And we did all of these things. Lord, we were doing things for you. We were doing things for you. That's what they're saying. Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? They're talking about a to-do list. What did Jesus say? Then I will announce to them, what? I never knew you. If, if I could unpack that just for a little bit, it would be like Jesus looking at someone who thought they were headed for heaven but they're headed for hell. Jesus, didn't we? I read my Bible. I, I showed up to church. I, I, I spent time in prayer. Lord, I did all of these things in your name. I did all of these things. I had a to-do list. That's what I understood a relationship with you to be like. Is It's a to-do list, and I did all of these things. And it's as if he looks at him and says, now come on, let's talk about your heart. You didn't really want to know me, did you? You didn't find joy in me. You didn't find happiness in me. You wanted a ticket to get out of hell, but you really didn't want to know me, and I never got to know you because you never wanted to know me. Depart from me, I never knew you. I'm telling you that I could ask you, are you saved? Or I could say, do you love the Lord? And is he who makes you happy? It's the same question. It's the same question. And while this is serious, this is God calling us to recognize that this whole thing of following him, regardless of what happens in our country, regardless of what happens in our community, in our home, and regardless of any of that, we can have a happiness rooted in a relationship with Jesus, and that's what it means to be saved. How do I know that I'm saved, preacher? Has there ever been a time, not only that you have given your life to Jesus and are you trusting but has there ever been a time, ideally it's happening right now, that you are finding your happiness in your relationship with the Lord? You're reading his word, but you're not doing it because it's a checklist. You love spending time with him. You're spending time in prayer, but you're not doing it because it's a checklist. You love talking to him. You're sharing the gospel with other people, not because you feel guilty when you don't, but you're doing it because you love the Lord and you want other people to know of this love for the Lord. This whole concept is rooted in the fact that God wants us to be happy. Salvation is how that happens as we not only are saved, but we recognize that this is a call into a relationship with Almighty God. I would even tell you this. There was within Christendom, and it's been around since the 1960s and 70s. It was a liberal theology, and it was this understanding that what are we to be about? It's not so much about sharing the gospel. It's about being nice to people and being good to people. And it was the social gospel about just doing acts of service. It's the second commandment, after all. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. This principle is saying, oh, that's good, but there's one even more important than that. 
What's the first and greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. God says, I know how I made you. I made you for happiness. I don't want you to just go through rituals of doing all of these things and feeling guilty when you don't. I want you to enjoy me. And when you're enjoying me, kind of doesn't so much matter what happens out there because you have this relationship with me to enjoy. And you also, as you are enjoying this relationship, it is instilling with you an even deeper longing and a deeper hope of that time when you get to be with him forever, forever. Are you happy in Jesus? Is he the source of your happiness? Are you delighting yourself in the Lord? And is he therefore giving you the desire of your heart? Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. And your word over and over and over and over makes it so abundantly clear that it's not a set of rules that we've been called to. It is a relationship with you that we are to enjoy. And we're reminded over and over in your word that if we were to take your word seriously and read it, study it, obey it, that that in itself would create a, a, an environment in which we would be able to flourish. Your word is given for human flourishing, for happiness. It's the husband and wife that comply with, with your word that are capable of having an enjoyable marriage. It's the, the mom and dad that are c committed to reading your word and, and how it is that they are to raise their children that, that cultivate a family that is a source of, of happiness. Over and over, we could talk about how your word is given to us so that it can cultivate within us a happiness happiness and obedience to you and a happiness ultimately in a relationship with you father i pray this morning that as we've come to this time of response lord i pray that we would not mindlessly sing the words that will be on the screen in front of us i pray that if we recognize that we've lost our joy We've let other things come in and robbed us of the joy. Lord, I pray that we would hear you calling us back into a relationship with you that can bring us happiness and put things back into perspective and enable us to be mentally, emotionally healthy as we're enjoying you again, Lord. And Father, I pray for that one in here this morning who has never come into relationship with you. They've never been saved. Lord, I pray this morning that you would cause them to realize that they have broken your laws, therefore they are guilty, but that you loved and loved them so much that you sent Jesus to pay the sin debt, to pay their sin debt, wipe it clean, if they'll only look to Jesus and trust in him to forgive them, and save them and therefore be brought into a relationship with you that they can enjoy i pray lord right now for that one who's not been saved that they would put their faith their trust in you jesus even right now lord as we go into this time of response i pray that we would make those adjustments that are necessary we pray this in jesus name amen